Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Odong, uh, Head of Projects at Equity Bank Uganda. Currently, I'm uh, working from uh, our head office here in Nairobi, uh, driving some um, group-wide projects. So um, I'm excited to be here today, uh, just to speak uh, from experiential perspective, uh, what we are trying to do and uh, what we have gone through the past few um, months. So maybe before, to put it in context, um, from a strategic perspective, what are we trying to achieve from a group? Uh, and I think what you see on the screen, uh, what we are calling Africa Recover Resilience Plan, it's a public document that we have uh, socialized at all levels across the world. Um, in terms of uh, driving, uh, um, uh, looking at uh, driving social transformation, uh, from the um, perspective of looking at uh, how do we build resilience in our communities and also having this uh, collaborative and ecosystem-based approach. So to drive this plan, we basically have uh, six pillars uh, focusing on that we want to... Um, we have different targets that we are looking at, uh, especially how do we reach 100 million customers. Um, while I'm speaking to this specifically, uh, I want to focus one of the key pillars that we have there is agriculture, food and agriculture, and then there's also technology enab enablement, and uh, it will form the latter part of my presentation. So when we speak to, in terms of food and agriculture, um, we want to drive financial inclusion. Today's subject is about the data sharing and how we can, uh, uh, and how it impacts on the uh, food ecosystems. And it really speaks to the equity group uh, philosophy and strategy that we are trying to uh, drive. Now, uh, I'll not dwell so much on this. Uh, this is just showing you again from uh, a strategic thinking perspective that uh, under the key pillar of food and agriculture, what are the key aspects that we are looking at? Is the value chain approach. Uh, we're also looking at uh, specific value chain, cereal, horticulture, and so forth. And then also looking at capacity building and incre increasing food production for food security. So when we look at that value chain approach and driving ecosystems, uh, it calls specifically, you know, Achieving that number of 100 million is not something that the bank is going to do on its own. It's going to work through partnerships, through collaborations, and most certainly through sharing of data uh, across uh, with the different to be able to achieve this. All from, from government, from fintechs, from agrotechs, from uh, uh, cooperatives, and so forth. So that we'll be able to achieve that uh, objective. And then also to do this, we are not going to do this manually, but it's something that we have to do um, using technology. Yeah? And that is why we are here. So as you can see so far, it's a well thought out plan. And uh, now when I go into the detail, maybe just uh, to show you some of the emerging trends, um, uh, in financial services. So we are looking at, um, because of the, the, uh, the digitization that is happening, uh, things to do with revenue share based models, things to do with um, uh, looking at digitizing various uh, value chains, looking at um, uh, also adapting finance uh, with the technology capability, and then also having open banking. So these are some of the uh, emerging trends that you are looking at in financial services, not um, your usual or normal uh, brick and mortar, but most of the transactions are now being driven outside 
uh, uh, the branch and being driven at the customer's uh, premises uh, uh, through digitization. So, for me, as a farmer, uh, my user story would be, uh, I want to be able to access the loan when purchasing inputs uh, and equipment, uh, which, and then also accessing uh, uh, this anytime over maybe the phone, but it should be readily accessible for me to get inputs. And also from the use case scenarios, me as a farmer, maybe I want to sell my produce, I want to be able to sell it at the best price possible and also access the markets. So the discussion is going to revolve around that use case scenario and what are the some of the challenges that we face and what kind of data that would need to be able to achieve and satisfy this use case scenario. So you notice that uh, uh, there are some gaps that we look at this. First of all, in terms of uh, from the input perspective, how do we bridge the gap between the farmer and the source and the suppliers of input readily available? Um, so that we also need to look at a technology platforms where you can actually uh, get inputs at readily at the time when you need it. And then when you're selling, how do you get the best price possible? Maybe a marketplace whereby if a, a supplier's bid, sorry, a buyer's bid for the farmer's produce. Because most of the time, because of middlemen, the farmers do not get the best price. But once they have the digital information that about on the marketplace, then when they're selling their produce, it is the one bidding with the highest price on the platform that would help the farmer. So, um, sorry, uh, this is just a, a little bit sneak view of Equity Bank. I just talk about to, uh, from a Ghanaian perspective. Uh, having over 2 million customers. As you can see, out of that 100 million, our portion is to reach maybe about 10 million customers uh, within that period of time. And uh, there are various channels that a financial institution, this I'm giving one as an example, but can also speak to any financial institution and what we are talking about here. Uh, you need to reach this number of customers. Uh, you have these various channels for cards, uh, and the internet banking, and then also their capabilities in terms of payment capabilities, in terms of money transfers and saving and investment. Most of the smallholder farmers want uh, uh, an opportunity to save money. Most of them, if they are mobile phones, probably keep the deposit, they keep depositing money in their mobile phones, and maybe don't transfer it to the financial institution. So. Uh, those are some of the capabilities that they would need. And then, of course, uh, having uh, access to where they can draw their money. So this is uh, speaking about Equity Bank and the capabilities that we have. Um, now, I want to speak to where we are now, that uh, in line with the strategy that we are talking about, uh, and we are doing this as part of the there's a project that we are working with, program that we're working with Agrifin to use alternative data-driven lending. Now, question is, how do we, uh, remember I talked about the use case scenario of the farmer. I want to access inputs at any time. And also the use case scenario of the farmer as a seller, also going through either cooperatives and different levels, aggregating to sell that information. But then you notice that uh, from the financial institution perspective, um, there's already work that has been done by development organizations, by government, by communities in building data over time. It can be held in different formats. It can be in Excel. It can be even manual books. But somewhere, somehow, at that level, already uh, you'll find that many of the circles, groups, and whatever, there's some form of lending going on and there's some information they use. But how can the bank 
a financial institution, utilize, pick this information, utilize it, and build algorithms and info and uh, squaring algorithms for credit squaring to be able to give loans uh, or financial services to uh, these particular customers. So you look at it, uh, that's what I'm looking at. So the, some of the key aspects that you're looking at there is in terms of uh, the credit squaring, building those models, and then also looking at, um, from a partnership perspective, the considerations with the, uh, we're looking at the target people at the fintechs, and you're looking at the, working with agritechs and fintechs, because they have this information that profiled it, but maybe some may not have the license to actually extend financial services in that country, wherever they're operating. That's when a financial institution comes in. So it has to be a partnership. On the other hand, a bank or financial institution may not have that capacity to go down to the last mile. And we'll use this uh, particular uh, organizations that have already uh, looked at. So that business model is for partnership. Then uh, key questions that keep coming up is customer ownership. Okay, This is my data, or is it the data of the customer? It is in my circle. If you're extending them credit, where? who owns the customer when it comes to the, uh, so this again another aspect look at in terms of the data sharing and the data access. Always um, there are considerations in every country in terms of privacy, in terms of sharing information. So sometimes you have to look at this from a point of anonymization of data so that it can be used to do credit scoring but without specifically revealing who that person uh, is uh, unless at if there any maybe there are any consents to share that data, so that is one consideration, and then of course the scoring capabilities. Okay, now the bank or a financial institution will look at their parameters they use to score to offer you credit. Okay, but now we are taking this leap to say, can we use the data that is available there? But what are the key aspects that we are looking at, maybe behavior, maybe trends over time, certain profiles. And this is speaking from information from the fintechs and telcos. You know, there's a lot of borrowing on the telcos, which is not covered, captured from the financial institution. So if you aggregate this data and look at that borrowing history from the telcos, those small airtime you borrow and everything and your repayment, it can also inform the credit scores. Uh, and then, uh, we can also look at uh, the other aspect key consideration is uh, the revenue share on transaction, maybe costs uh, with the fintech or telco because this is their data. They are provided, this data are provided. Uh, so you work out a revenue sharing model based on that kind of uh, information. So these are the key aspects to consider when looking at uh, uh, the data if you are if it's partners in terms of the data sharing, uh, speaking to what I mentioned about reaching digital enable, enabling, uh, reaching uh, the various uh, food ecosystems, uh, using the agritechs that have already done a lot of work in this area, and uh, also, so about some of the challenges that I mentioned earlier, um, is the issue of data integrity and currency of data. So how reliable is this data? It's the partner you're working with, have they collected over time. So sometimes, uh, I think it has happened a lot in telcos, where uh, people switch from phone to phone, okay? They will just register another SIM card because your credit history is this SIM card. So when I'm unable to borrow, if I'm unable, I just switch off that line, I get another one. But then those kind of the integrity of data, that is also being used by the financial institution to generate the credit squaring. And uh, also currency of data. If, especially if you're looking at pharma data, how do you update it, keep it updated? You know, If I looked at your farm size, your uh, crop history or uh, production history over the last three seasons, what about the times when you're not producing? So can I use that data two years down the road to generate a credit score and offer financial service. Because remember, 
um, relying on that information to give you credit maybe over the phone. You've not even interacted with the bank and you're doing this sometime at midnight, okay? But using that, uh, that information. And then um, consent, uh, handling consent uh, at the point of data collection and then also looking at uh, the cost of credit squaring. The, everybody has their different models of credit squaring, but how can we think about um, some bureaus may be selling these credit scores. So if you want a credit score which aggregates all this information, uh, it is at this cost, and this cost has to be transferred to the farmer at the point when they are borrowing. And then also, of course, um, the regulatory requirements on data privacy, uh, cost of collecting, uh, and the financial models, cost of collecting this data, because you know, some of these uh, farmers or smallholders are in very remote places. So it, uh, collecting that data and keeping it updated becomes very costly. That's why we need to work with the people who are at, at those respective communities who constantly, maybe uh, digital village agents that keep updating this data. But now once that data comes, some of the opportunities that would be uh, available for that uh, is aggregation of data. So can maybe say fintechs, agritechs come together, aggregate this data, pick up, uh, so that a financial institution can come and consume this data, data being uh, like a currency, and maybe buy the credit scores, uh, plug in so that uh, it's, it's something that it might reduce the overall cost, but also helps in terms of updating, uh, keeping the information updated and uh, working together rather than plugging in and developing and working with the different fintechs, the aggregate come together and then um, it will be like a, a reference bureau uh, of sorts for this kind of information. And then of course, uh, also working with anchors, like you can call them like digital anchors uh, for de-risking. Um, so when you're, I go through maybe a cooperative, I onboard them as a digital anchor, and I serve the farmers that are under that particular anchor. It also helps because they have some records about those farmers and can help in, in case of any follow-ups. We're also looking at uh, maybe so things like pool accounts, uh, by maybe farmers contributing their respective pools, uh, savings, and so forth. So if you pick that digital information, it can also help. Then uh, standardization, I've talked about it. Mapping of profiles across the fintechs and standardize them. Uh, also facilitate open APIs for integrations uh, with the telcos, with the fintechs, and also with the financial institutions. This is something that can be driven from a regulator perspective, from a government perspective, also from a development partner perspective who can support uh, this kind of conversations. And then of course, also, incentives, how do incentivize the farmers to keep the information updated, their produces production history, sales history, uh, the markets they've been accessing, so that they continuously utilize the platforms and it keeps updating the data. Uh, maybe some loyalty programs for that. And then also uh, encourage farmers to be part of, we don't look, leave them out, uh, we don't leave them out, but make them part of the whole discussion so that they become like part owners and shareholders in this whole conversation. So, um, uh, of course, also looking at aspects of uh, uh, how do you keep the data current, maybe purchasing, purchasing financial institutions, keeping purchasing this data at respective uh, intervals from the various uh, fintechs who are producing this data so that it also keeps them in business to keep collecting that information. So, um, I think I will uh, I'll stop there uh, in the interest of time. But um, I'll just maybe mention just one last thing that uh, sometimes for the fintechs, the, what would a financial institution offer in terms of this partnership? What is the value proposition as well? So also looking at, they are, it's not just about data, but there are also other benefits in terms of uh, having collections for financial institutions, which keeps, uh, remember, the credit squaring is expensive, 
but if you have another alternative source of uh, revenue from the bank uh, in terms of collections management, in terms of disbursements, and also being a sub-agent, and also card issuance and acquiring. So some of these are solutions that can make the value proposition for the integrations with the fintechs more appealing so that they can be take on this activity of collecting and sharing the data. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Simon Mulua, and uh, I work for CARO in the ICT office. And today, I just want to do a very short presentation that highlights some of the key initiatives that we have been uh, able to do in terms of data and collaboration. So as I start, I would want to give just a brief introduction about CARO or on CARO. So CARO is a government agency working under the Ministry of Agriculture. We are in the State Department for Agriculture. And uh, we have a few mandates that we are uh, given to undertake. But for the purposes of today's presentation, uh, I will dwell a lot on uh, the mandate number three, which is on equitable access to research information. So for this uh, ALE activity, you're basically talking about data sharing and collaboration. And, uh, that is a very key uh, item for CARO, being uh, uh, given the mandate to undertake uh, agricultural research and uh, at the same share the, this kind of information. So for us, that is uh, very key. And in line with that, uh, we take it very serious uh, when it comes to uh, sharing and making this uh, information available to various stakeholders. Um, so as I begin, maybe is to just uh, identify and uh, share with you why is it important to share data as uh, the partners, whether farmers, uh, development partners, other research organization, is that uh, it's very key for collaboration, also for decision making. And I mean with data, that's how we create uh, relevant innovations that we can either use uh, at uh, policy level or at farm level. Uh, so for us, we identify the role of data basically by addressing the areas for each different stakeholder. And uh, I just went ahead and identified a few of the stakeholders. And some of these stakeholders are farmers. We have the research collaborators. We have uh, governments, whether county or national, and we also have our development partners. Because most of the time we think of data for our own ingestion, but we never consider the entire ecosystem of uh, partners who are involved. Because when I was told to do a presentation on data sharing, first thing I asked myself was, am I talking about data sharing between myself and a partner, or between, between myself and a research institution? Or who am, I, uh, who am I sharing the data with? So I looked at it from the different perspective in terms of the various stakeholders we have. And one of them was farmers. When we, sh we say we share data, as a research organization, we do research. But then what do we do with that research? That research needs to go to the first stakeholder who needs to use that research information as an output in terms of a new breed for livestock or a new variety for crops. So that information needs to first address the farmer, who is the uh, end user of most of the research and why we are here today. So we look at this uh, role of data in transforming food systems by one, being able to reduce uh, cultivation costs or boost productivity, increase sales, or fortify the resilience of these farmers in line with climate change. Then when we talk about CALRO sharing data or collaboration, we are talking of other research organizations. What are we sharing? If a researcher goes and undertakes a research and they get the metadata from the field or whatever, there's no need for someone else to still go ahead and do the same research. We are saying that we need to have policies and measures 
so that we can do data reuse that has already been collected. So those are areas where researchers can collaborate on. Then governments. When we say data needs to be available, for governments it's very key because this is the data that they will need to make policy briefs to advise governors or the local government of why we need to incre increase the number of farmers doing uh, a, a certain value chain that suddenly has a market, international market. So they need that data to align themselves as governments. Development partners, I think it's about time that uh, you don't just make funds available. Then you invest your funds based on evidence-based funding based on the data that has already been derived or that is being collected. So that when you say you want to ingest and give Manu 100 million to undertake a certain activity that helps the smallholder farmers, let Manu come and give you data that shows, yes, there is this gap that I can address based on that. Then you invest as a donor based on uh, uh, based on uh, evidence based in, in line with data. For my chapter two, I was looking at data sharing and collaboration. And in, uh, in line with this, Escaro, to deliver on our core mandate, which is share data, we maintain strategic collaborations with almost, I would say, with everyone in this room. Because you either fall as a national or regional institution, research institution, or international agricultural research center, national or local or international universities, a development partner, county governments, private or NGOs, farmer-based or faith-based or any organization. We work with CARO or you work with CARO in one way or another. So we maintain these uh, collaborations because they help us deliver some very key uh, aspects of our day-to-day -day work. Uh, we wanted to look at the impacts that we get from these collaborations. And um, when I was trying to figure out on the things to say, I, I couldn't really get enough words to say everything, because uh, Manu said you need 10 minutes. So uh, I, I thought the best way I could present this, and I thought I'll just give diagrams that say precision agriculture, that talk about uh, land rehabilitation, food security, we have uh, mechanized farming, we have uh, data analysis, access to markets. So we are saying these collaborations that we have with our various partners allow us to solve some of the issues of, we are talking of climate change, biodiversity conservation, post-harvest loss, economic growth conflict, human wildlife conflict in the areas that uh, we are competing for resources. We as CARO cannot deliver on this alone, and that's why we collaborate with people who are key and experts in this, whether as a, an expert or development partners. For chapter three, I identify some of the use cases that are coming out uh, from data sharing or collaborations. And uh, for this, I had to take us back to where we started as CARO uh, when we started uh, doing data sharing. So we identified we had uh, a lot of data in our records, whether in books or in hard copies. So the first thing we thought was, uh, how do we digitize this? So we started by creating innovations that uh, were disrupting the normal way of doing business. Uh, telling you today it was going to rain, then what? We have to tell you it's going to rain, then probably you don't need to indicate your crops, then wait for the rain. So inform, inform you on information that will help you make informed decision. So for that, we use emerging technologies and existing tools to digitize that information on weather, agronomic advisories, bundled it together and create use cases, and created capacity building for the various stakeholders so that they know about these tools. And through that, they have now taken up some of those uh, tools or use cases, and they are now doing them at scale on our behalf to reach the intended uh, uh, stakeholders across the globe. Uh, where are we in terms of data sharing? 
So we have created tools for digitization. Camis is for market, has market data. We have innovations like the uh, selector. Uh, this allows you to use GPS to see what you can plan based on where you're standing, just using your phone. Uh, it give you a, a, an, a, an advisory of what to grow, how, where, and when. We have disruptions like CALP that is giving weather and uh, integrated ma uh, market information. So that we are not just telling you it's going to rain, we will tell you when it rains and before it rains and what crops you can grow, where, when, and how. We have agricultural intelligence. So this is where we are talking of uh, being able to give use cases that are showing uh, or being, uh, helping farmers deal with the post, uh, pest and disease management. We're also working on things like uh, yield forecast uh, so that we can be able to use this information, advise whether farmers or governments to know that uh, these are expected yields and then they can uh, adjust their food balance sheets according whether through imports or whichever means they apply. Uh, so this is a curve that gives weather and integrated market, uh, market information. You just have to select three buttons and you get uh, weather advisory, show you crops, the value chains you're growing, what you need in terms of uh, from land preparation all the way to uh, post-harvest management. When we say collaborations and talk about use cases for, from collaborations, and in line with data sharing, we have uh, developed uh, a data sharing platform in collaboration with one of our partners, Digital Green, to be able to share or avail use cases that we can use. So this is a new, I would say, baby in the, <laughs> in the making, or oh, it's out there. So this is going to be one of the very key platforms as we go forward. Uh, we are hoping that uh, we get all the necessary support from all our partners, and then we can see it through. Uh, imagine a system where you just come and see the information that you need, request for it, uh, for the various uh, columns that you need, and then uh, we get to see whether we can uh, make approvals for those requests. Of course, we are all doing this in line with the Kenya Data Protection Act. I will come to that a uh, few minutes uh, from now. So challenges and uh, appreciating the challenges and opportunities. And I have to appreciate the people who thought of the topics. The topics were really good, and uh, they are bringing out very key issues. Because uh, if you don't uh, look at the issues or challenges that are there in data and collaboration, then uh, you are not really talking about data because they are very key issues that we need to discuss, but they do have solutions. So I looked at some of the opportunities. And uh, for those of you who are wondering, yes, that's my handwriting. I, 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 I wondered how I could present these opportunities and so I just took a pen and a piece of paper and started writing, and then took the picture and made it into a presentation. So, <laughs> so I looked at some of the opportunities we have. We have opportunities to do precision agriculture, because we keep on mentioning the word, but the question is, are our small order farmers doing that? Maybe we just throw the words in meetings like this and we don't really do it at the ground level. So we need to think of these opportunities, uh, get them and start addressing these. If we are, then we need to increase on the impact. Issues of crop, pest management, market access, climate resilience, research and information. And for the other partners, uh, of course, is evidence-based decision making. We have opportunities for capacity building. I think when we were in the main, um, uh, main session, uh, the, uh, the guy who presented on AI mentioned that uh, we only have 10,000 AI experts in the world. You can imagine uh, a population. We are in the world, we are around, what, 7 billion? So how is uh, 10,000 people supposed to help 7 billion people? So we have opportunities to uh, do capacity building on some of the back-end uh, courses that will end up influencing 
uh, our data sharing and of course towards the uh, uh, food security uh, agenda. Uh, some of the challenges, I mean, throughout the uh, yesterday and today, I've had some of these challenges being mentioned, the issues of data privacy, of course the le uh, legal issues that uh, uh, involved, whether in data sharing or in collaboration itself, because there are some people you want to collaborate with, you go to the extent of having to sign NDAs. It's like we don't trust one another, but uh, that's, those are some of the challenges. We have uh, ethical considerations, and of course, sustainability of these uh, collaborations. Because sometimes we just come together uh, for a few months, do something, then we run away. But we need to ensure that some of, uh, some of these key ideas or uh, projects that we come up with have a sustainability plan to make sure that uh, they do not end with the collaboration. As I finish, I was uh, Googling the other day and uh, I come across uh, this uh, animation. So the story behind the animation is that uh, some research guy who was uh, smart, smarter than the monkeys, eh, put a ladder, put some bananas at the top of the ladder, and they put one monkey inside the room. So when the monkey tried to reach the banana, he would spray the monkey with water. Then uh, he put a second monkey. The second monkey came, saw the bananas, wondered why the first guy is not going for the bananas. As he went for the bananas, he sprayed the monkey with water. So he did the same for the dad. By the fifth or sixth, tenth monkey, he stopped spraying them with water. So what was happening was that any other new monkey who was brought in the room, when he tried to go up the ladder to pick the monkey, uh, the banana, the other monkeys were the, <laughs> were the ones who were pulling <laughs> the new monkey down. Why? Because they know what happens. If anyone tries to go up, you are sprayed with water. So this one, this is what is happening with data protection right now. We are all scared of sharing data. I mean, today when I was coming in the morning, I was told uh, sign a consent form so that uh, you don't end up suing us when we take your photos. <laughs> so we are saying, uh, I think what I'm saying is that, yes, we need to be worried about data sharing, but there are ways of working uh, to, to get out. Uh, there are ways to, to work against, uh, not really against, but to, to see us being able to share data ethically and uh, in the correct way. But what is happening is that you go and ask for data for someone, they, they tell you, oh no, the Data Protection Act, oh, data privacy. So we are in that case. So the people who are working in this space needs to come out with data sharing framework, governance protocols uh, that really tell us, yes, you can share data and this is the right protocol. Because when you start asking about data sharing, people will always tell you, throw, anyone who comes to me, I'll just tell them, oh, data protection. And then I, I move on with my business. So that's not the right way. Thank you. I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Uh, any question for him before he steps down? Uh, thank you for the presentation. My name is Charles Mangi from the Kenya Space Agency. And the question is tied to the other presentation we had from Equity. And I was wondering what is the role of government institutions in terms of making data available? And you also mentioned the the earlier presentation on AI, because one of the issues we are facing, even in terms of training the AI models, is, is data. How then do we capacitate the, uh, and again, myself are coming from a government agency, how do we capacitate the government institutions to be the custodians of such data? Because again, they, they add a lot of value, the, because the private sector will only be in the business when it is, when it is commercially viable if you can respond to that. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, myself and you, we, all, we both work for the government. And I think uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, make it our business to worry about uh, the data hosting or creating frameworks on sharing. 
So we need to institutionalize uh, policies to allow even the government first to share data. Because if someone has come from a different ministry and asked for data for myself, as even a government entity, I'll not even give them. So we need to start that circle within ourselves. And uh, I think, the, well, it's not really a mistake, but if we allow someone else to come in and s start telling us what to do with our data, then you are not taking the lead in it. And uh, I mean, anyone who comes with an idea knows the vision they have. So until we have our own vision on how we want to store and manage and access the data, then we will always be letting external forces to come and tell us what they need, but they always have their own uh, agenda. Once that is finished, then they move away. So we just need to have a very well-structured way of collaborating as government and, of course, come up with ways of how to store access that data within ourselves, then we make uh, provisions of sharing that data with the private sector. I think that would be my comment. Yeah. Good morning, uh, Millicent Okumo. Uh, my question is, um, what ways are you going about achieving voluntary data sharing across partnerships? Because we know that for some of us, this data is actually our competitive edge. So how are you going about um, making sure that we voluntarily share this data with you? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. And uh, uh, I really uh, uh, think in this, uh, in the century we are in, anyone who is holding data as a competitive advantage, I would think, I would want to tell you that uh, you might need to start looking for another advantage. Because <laughs> if we have systems like AI that I can just go and ask it, uh, please uh, get me a data set on the following. Uh, compare this data set with data set X and give me the output because I want to present this. So uh, you either share the data or you will be overcome by events. Because uh, I think that's where we are going. Of course, there's data that uh, will be for you, uh, where we have patents and all. But uh, that's not the data people are asking for. Uh, I gave the example of a, a researcher who has done their study and probably published even their PhD. You've already been given a PhD, you have published in ResearchGate and all that. Question is, why are you holding your metadata in a notebook and you don't want to share? You've already published your work, you're a doctor. Why not share with the young researchers who are coming on board? So that uh, rather than me trespassing four uh, counties to collect the same data, yet you have it in your laptop. And you already achieved your objective. Give me the data and I reuse it to create a new paper. And of course, I will acknowledge you. Thank you. And I'm going to be talking about um, a livestock information crowdsourcing initiative uh, that was started uh, way back in 2021. Uh, and, and here we wanted to... Uh, first of all, have a way to uh, collect ground truthing uh, information because one of the programs that uh, ILRI is implementing is around uh, index-based livestock insurance. And so uh, issues around product uh, design and product improvement become important. Um, so but that process relies heavily on uh, satellite uh, data, but we wanted also to have a way to ground truth um, uh, the normalized difference vegetation index. But the other reason also why we started this initiative was to be able to actually understand the mechanisms through which climatic shocks, uh, and particularly drought, uh, were impacting households. Uh, so let me uh, give a little bit of background here. Uh, our motivation was really uh, coming from the, the severe impacts that uh, drought shocks have um, on, on livestock systems, and particularly pastoralist um, uh, systems, right? And so. Uh, we felt, well, without really addressing these uh, climatic shocks, it's very difficult to imagine how the livestock sector would, um, uh, would I mean, how sustainable develop, um, uh, livestock systems would be in terms of uh, their development and contribution to, to economic development. Uh, and so it was critical, therefore, that we address drought shocks. But um, how do you do that if you don't understand how exactly uh, those shocks are impacting households? 
but also you can imagine that this information uh, would be relevant, right, for uh, anticipatory action, uh, you know, for early action uh, of those pastoralist households. Um, one constant, though, was that these places tend to be super remote, uh, and therefore collecting data, as Paul was mentioning, in those setups uh, is, is a big challenge. Um, and also those contests tend to be conflict uh, prone, right? So they are fragile in that sense, and uh, it's difficult. I mean, not many people are willing to go in those setups to collect data. Uh, just to speak a little bit more in terms of the challenges, um, is that in these remote setups, previously most efforts relied on uh, paper questionnaires or questionnaire. Uh, I mean, conventional ways of collecting data. Uh, as you know, those uh, those uh, activities tend to be quite expensive, right? We need to recruit enumerators. We need to train them. Uh, and then dispatch them, supervise data collection for an extended period of time. And what that means is that in efforts to cut costs, uh, there's, there's risk here of underrepresentation, um, but, but also the frequency of data collection uh, tends to reduce, right? I mean, we are lucky if we collect data annually, but you know, rarely do you see, for example, a frequency less than that, right? Uh, and this, this poses a problem because then it becomes difficult to monitor indicators that are changing at a fairly uh, uh, high frequency or quite rapidly. And so how do we monitor such dynamic indicators in such fragile setups? So we came up with this uh, approach which we call CASNET. Uh, CASNET is, uh, as I said, is a crowdsourcing technique. Uh, it collects data on multiple dimensions. We are monitoring indicators at um, three levels at the moment. We look at what's happening in the markets. Um, so we have people we call contributors, and, and these people have been recruited from the local context. Again, as Paul was saying, the importance of having people in such remote setups that can collect data on our behalf. So we recruit carefully those people in consultation with the communities. So there's the whole aspect of trust here. Um, but then those people uh, would go to markets, right, on, on market days and collect data for us uh, about uh, livestock prices, livestock body conditions, how many volumes of a particular species are being sold on a particular day. So that's the type of information we collect. But besides um, uh, livestock data, we also want to understand prices of uh, food commodities, and so we collect that data as well. Um, at the household level, we also are interested to understand indicators such as uh, food consumption patterns. Uh, what are the coping strategies that households are using? Uh, what are the livestock mortality rates at the household level? And so we collect data uh, related to those indicators as well. And then uh, the last indicator, and, uh, 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 or rather level, and which I think is, is very important here, is understanding the rangeland conditions, right, or the rangeland health. And here we basically look at what, what, what is uh, the status of forage availability. Is the forage uh, suitable for consumption by the different species of animals, uh, for example. And so we look at not just availability of forage, but also forage uh, uh, quality. So we set up what we call uh, sentinel zones, both in the uh, northern Kenya and southern Ethiopia, so in the drylands. Uh, the pilot phase, as I said, started in 2021. Uh, we had two sentinel uh, uh, sites, and then within that we created what we call uh, sentinel clusters. But then, you know, um, making sure that we can monitor markets, we can monitor households, and we can monitor rangelands as well. Um, and so, because we were interested to understand the nutrition status of children and monitor that as well, and that's why uh, in, in the earlier slide you saw, for example, that we are monitoring the mid-upper arm circumference, we also required that the households uh, had a child uh, under five years. Um, so that pilot, we were only able to cover six mar mar uh, livestock markets. The objective here was to really see whether this was an approach that could collect data in a robust way you know, quality data that can be trusted and that can actually be useful for decision making. Uh, and as I said, we collect data every week uh, at all those three levels. 
So just to give you a bit of uh, what, what we see from these types of information. So for example, here you see that we can look at uh, suitability of, uh, of forage for different livestock species, and you can see how the, that relates, for example, uh, trends in rainfall, but also consumption uh, you know, behavior at household level. Uh, and, and, but important also is that you are able to see when trends in some key indicators, for example, begin to decline or begin, begin to improve, and therefore you can be able to take decisions quite uh, early. Uh, here is also another example just to show again the relationship between uh, forage conditions and livestock, uh, I mean, and, and milk production. Um, and here is another one now focused on nutrition uh, indicators. What you see here is um, the women, for example, we are working with taking the measurement of uh, uh, the mid upper arm circumference of the child. Uh, and they've been able to use this information, for example, when the situation is terrible to, uh, to seek um, uh, medical advice. Um, so, so what we see already from the pilot phase is that multidimensional high frequency data really provide timely information. Uh, about forage deficits, but also about performance of markets. And we see already that this information has been uh, helpful in some contexts in uh, actually informing pastoralists to make early decisions in terms of uh, procuring, uh, procuring feed uh, so that they can protect the animal from, uh, uh, the animals from dying. Um, but so, uh, after the pilot phase, we are currently implementing uh, a scaling phase both in, I mean in both countries. We see this as being important. Uh, as we saw in the pilot, there were only a few markets, a few households, and so of course the representation was small, but this expansion now allows us to have more data points and, and also move uh, to larger geographies, and so we have greater representation now uh, and, and making the data more relevant. So for example, in, in Kenya now, we are covering uh, 16 markets uh, and monitoring 144 households every week. Um, and, and in Ethiopia, we are actually monitoring 25 uh, markets and, uh, and also a big number of households. There are 396, so close to 400 households. Um, now, the other thing we've done, uh, and, and, and previous speakers have talked about, I mean, it's not just collecting data for the sake of collecting it, but how do we make sure that data is reaching the end users for you know, timely decision making? And so the CASNET platform has a dashboard through which we are disseminating this information directly to pastoralists so people can sign up just to receive information. You don't need to necessarily be a contributor collecting data for, uh, for us. But you, you, know, you can just sign up as someone who is interested in, um, in the information. And this gives you, for example, what you see is a capacity building exercise to help uh, communities understand how they can use this information. Um, and, and here you see some of the graphical presentation of the, of the information coming from CASNET. So we are working with pastoralist groups as an entry point. Uh, currently working with about 400 uh, livestock producer and marketing uh, groups in three counties in Kenya. So that is Samburu, uh, Marsabit, and, uh, and Isiolo as well. Um, in terms of partnerships, uh, we are working very closely with the Kenya Livestock uh, Marketing Council because they also have uh, what they call the um, uh, Livestock Marketing Associations. Uh, those are very important entry points for us for collecting data but also disseminating back to them. But more important is also because KLMC has an information, uh, a market information system. And so we are not looking uh, for an approach that somehow uh, competes with what already exists, but we are looking at how information coming from CASNET can support and fill gaps in, uh, uh, in, the, in the system that the government already has. We are working with the National Drought Management Authority basically to provide um, marketing information which they have identified as, uh, as the main gap uh, in what they are doing. Uh, and that then becomes important, for example, when they are working on the monthly um, uh, bulletins that they disseminate to the counties. And then we collaborate very closely with the county governments uh, of the three counties that, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, the data are accessible. Uh, Ilri being uh, a member of the CGIR consortium, uh, all this information for us is public good, and so once the information is organized, 
uh, you know, it's, it's actually published uh, open access. Uh, we have a dataverse and, and people can go there and access it. Um, the other way we are disseminating the information is through the Kenya Ag Observatory platform that uh, uh, Simon was talking about. Uh, so that goes through the, what we, there's another platform in between called Ag Data Hub, but then through the Ag Data Hub, the data is pushed to the uh, KOP, also for dissemination to, um, uh, to other stakeholders. So we have different dissemination channels here and different types of partnerships we are leveraging. So, yeah, let me pause here and uh, happy to address any questions. Thank you. Thanks, hello. I'm uh, Oscar from IDH. I'm just curious how, um, what incentive mechanisms do you have for uh, getting such frequent data collection? Yeah, it's, um, it's a question we, we uh, personally have been, as, as a person leading this initiative, I've been um, uh, struggling with for some time. But one of the things that we do is um, uh, have conversations with communities. So the process of setting up this initiative is really a participatory exercise right, that engages the communities very closely. At that stage, we make it salient to the communities uh, what the value of the data could be. Right? So, so they see uh, why it would Im be important for them to be collecting this, uh, I mean, to be interviewed, for example, every week but also for the contributors themselves, right? Because sometimes they have to go to distant markets to collect this information. But because they are pastoralists themselves, we try to make it salient to them how this information could be valuable uh, to, uh, to themselves. And that's why we brought in the dissemination aspect, right? So, you know, they, they are collecting data. At the beginning, they were asking, well, but can we see anything from this data? Where is it going? Uh, and so that's why we started the dissemination approach so that they can actually be able to see trends in those key indicators over you know, a period of time. That has helped a lot uh, in terms of an incentive. But the other uh, thing that, that we are doing is uh, uh, provide, for example, uh, airtime to the contributors uh, so that they, they don't have, for example, reasons to say, uh, I mean, reasons for not submitting data, right? Uh, because for us it's important the data comes in weekly. Uh, we are moving towards also somehow a bit of improved targeting in the selection of the contributors. So for example, when we started at the beginning, uh, the idea was to, and that's why we worked with a small number, was that we even provided smartphones to the contributors we were working with. Well, we saw that was not going to be a sustainable approach. So instead what we did, uh, and taking advantage of the high penetration of uh, a mobile network and, and, and smartphones in this context, we started to target uh, contributors that also have smartphones. And we, now we work, we don't provide those types of uh, incentives anymore or gadgets, but we already can identify people that uh, have those types of uh, uh, smartphones. So it seems to be working, but I'm also currently implementing uh, an experiment within this initiative where we test the you know, how sensitive, for example, uh, data collection efforts would be uh, to the withdrawal of, uh, you know, of, the, of the incentives. So that's, you know, we're still collecting data, but uh, hopefully soon I'll have uh, opportunity to say something more concretely about the sensitivity to the incentives. And in this case, I mean the monetary incentive. Uh, last year, we had a partnership with Rabo Foundation, ICEAL, EFAD, Netherlands Food Partnership, and even Syngenta Foundation to understand how data sharing can help us improve smallholder farmer incomes and also improve the viability of SMEs that work in the agricultural sector. So I think in my uh, few minutes that I take, uh, you'll hear a lot of private sector to private sector data sharing, and we'll be conceptualizing on those uh, types of data sharing arrangements. Starting with why data, I think uh, there is, like, I've been in the agricultural sector for over 11 years, and since 2015, there has been an overwhelming focus on data for agriculture. And uh, while Simon had covered a few stakeholders and how they benefit from data, I like to talk about two incremental stakeholders. One is the SMEs and agribusinesses. I think one of the 
great understandings that I had in agriculture is that technology is not only for smallholder farmers, it's for businesses and it helps businesses optimize their operations. Many a times this optimization leads to benefits that can be transferred to smallholder farmers. So using data, we have seen SMEs and agribusinesses uh, optimize their sourcing decisions, understand where they have to go for sourcing, how can they best plan logistics. At the same time, using farmer data, they're able to provide services to farmers better through uh, things such as farmer segmentation and classification. Besides SMEs and agribusinesses, we heard about uh, Equity Bank and how financial institutions use data for de-risking their investments. But uh, IDH also works a lot with agri-corporates and they have a large focus on data uh, because again, it helps them optimize their sourcing. But today there are lots of compliances such as EUDR and to meet those compliances, you'll soon start requiring a lot more data. So I think there's also been a focus of corporates to move to data-driven sourcing to cover themselves from reputational risk. Uh, while these benefits are there, I'll quickly talk about today's data ecosystem and whenever I speak to stakeholders that have been engaged in agricultural data, they have often used the word that it's chaotic, the whole data ecosystem in agriculture is chaotic. There are many reasons for this. Uh, firstly, duplication, everyone is collecting data and Many a times it's from the same subjects. Many a times, like when it comes to weather data, many people are setting up their own automated weather stations. Uh, such duplication has led to fragmented data pools and since data collection is expensive at the, if I may use the word, first mile, it's, it's a lot of resources which are wasted on data collection which could have been probably shared and we could have optimized uh, the whole ecosystem. Uh, similarly, Although while everyone is collecting their own data, there is limited interoperability in data. Like if I have uh, data, I might not be able to combine it with data that someone else is collecting and that's a big challenge. This is a bigger challenge is because if we don't address this problem now, interoperability will be a bigger challenge in the years to come. Uh, poor data quality, I think everyone is aware of this uh, because a lot of the people in AgriFin work with digital solutions. They understand how important data is, not only the quantity, but also the quality. That's a big challenge. From the farmer side, uh, in some of our programs, we have had challenges in farmers sharing the data with us because they say, okay, just last season, someone else came and collected the same data. There's a growing fatigue amongst farmers for sharing their data and this could in fact be detrimental to the whole digital agricultural movement if farmers shy away from sharing data and this is seen in the form of farmer fatigue when it comes to sharing data and finally uh, I think there's a lot of challenge around data governance uh, once we have data from the farmers they have limited visibility on how it's being used, what are the risks, and mostly consent which is taken from them is a very broad consent which allows us to do anything with the data. Uh, so I think data governance is a big challenge. In our partnership last year with uh, many stakeholders, what we realized is that data sharing could, share some, uh, could solve some of the challenges that we just mentioned and also the other speakers mentioned. But before getting into that, I just wanted to set an expectation of what we mean by data sharing because I think uh, that's going to guide conversations in the future. Uh, so the way IDH looks at data sharing is that it's a scenario where two or more value chain actors, which could include smallholder farmers, share data amongst themselves under a set of binding agreements and principles. So it's not like borrowing something from your neighbor, which is very informal. Uh, it's more about having a set of principles and agreements in place, which all stakeholders adhere to. The intention of such data sharing for us is that it reduces the amount of data you need to collect. It helps in reusing the data for different purposes like Simon was mentioned. And it also helps in experimentation and recycling data for different use cases which may be forward looking like for the use of machine learning or uh, similar uh, advanced analytics purposes. So reduce, reuse, recycle is a concept which I think from the circularity space can also be applied in the data space. And with this reduction, reuse, and recycling of data, we understand that it leads to a reduction in the costs associated with data collection, which is very high normally, data management, and data analysis. Our hypothesis is that if these costs reduce, it can somehow, if we have binding principles in place, it can reduce the cost of servicing smallholder farmers and make these services more affordable for smallholder farmers. Because services are becoming more affordable, we have seen instances where there's an increase in service uptake. Uh, also, the amount of data that can be 
collected or consolidated is much higher than when an enterprise collects it individually. With more data, you can design better products. You can also design better services. And uh, like we had seen in the first, uh, in Simon's presentation for development enablers, sharing data can reduce the cost associated with monitoring, evaluation, and learning. While these, this definition is something that we think are, it's an evolving definition, uh, based on this definition, last year we studied several use cases of data sharing, and these were actually happening on the ground. I'll quickly cover a few of these uh, data sharing use cases, but what we saw is on the ground, data was shared either because of a business case or there was an impact case for data sharing. And business case, when it comes to business case, uh, I think access to finance is the most popular case that keeps coming and Equity Bank's presentation was really insightful on those terms. Uh, so I think in today's opening address by Seika, he mentioned that it's about leveraging our competitive advantages to serve farmers better. And when it comes to access to finance, we have had instances where off-takers who have good relationship with farmers, have better data on farmers, share data with financial service providers. Now the financial service provider knows that it's quality data that's coming up and they're able to reduce the, le uh, uh, the lending rates to the farmers. So in India, we have seen that in one example, data sharing has led to a reduction in a interest rate by two to three percent. Uh, in another case uh, in Ghana where we are working with an organization, an agritech uh, called AgroCenter, uh, AgroCenter provides a digital platform for SMEs to, share, to save the transaction data with farmers. This transaction data is then shared with banks to provide access to finance to the SMEs and also to the farmers that they work with. Uh, access to insurance is another use case that comes to mind and it's also becoming very popular. Uh, last year in one of, we had organized a learning event on data sharing and there were close to 900 registrants and there was a lot of interest in this topic. And one of the speakers was from Acre Africa how they, and they mentioned how they use smallholder farmer data to provide insurance to farmers and the same data was being used for providing access to advisory to farmers. So it's like reusing the data for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday I was speaking with Ko Amana here and they have been digitizing marketplaces. They have been using this digitized data to provide them with insurance via Pula, which is an agritech here. So there is data sharing that's happening in practice and there are some use cases. Beyond finance, we have also seen that uh, data sharing has been used for procurement. Uh, there are several corporates that want, uh, they, that have quality measures, they have, uh, they promote the use of sustainable practices. And in, in Indonesia, we studied a case where farming practices and the data related to such farming practices was shared with corporates who were end buyers of uh, the agricultural produce. And in exchange for that data, the corporate was giving farmers a premium, which they call the living income premium, uh, focused on improving the incomes of smallholder farmers. There are also some very advanced use cases of data sharing that we see. Uh, in India, there are examples of uh, geospatial companies that are using satellite imagery to collect data on 32 data points from farmers. And using satellite imagery, they can go back a couple of years, actually three years. And using this data collected through satellites, they are doing a credit score uh, for banks uh, using satellite imagery. Now, before this intervention, banks would have to collect their own data, do their own credit scoring, but this has actually reduced the amount of data that's being collected, and uh, banks can leverage such service providers who have already analyzed the data to at least make the first cut of lending decisions. Another interesting use case is around service correlations uh, that IDH has been uh, working on is, and, and wants to promote. Uh, in many geographies, you don't have one service provider that can meet all needs of smallholder farmers. In that case, you form correlations. Someone is providing inputs, someone is doing off-taking, someone is providing access to finance. So in such scenarios, can there be pre-investments or co uh, like, let's call it pre-competitive collaboration to Re, to invest in data collection. So instead of one person or one organization spending on data collection, can all three split costs, and that can be an example of data sharing. Another advanced use case, I think a parallel discussion is happening. It's around digital platforms, because platforms enable everyone to speak the same language, and it enables data transfer between different stakeholders. So that's also in practice. Uh, there are also some impact-first or uh, impact-focused uh, examples of data sharing. I think uh, digital public goods is one of the key impact-focused uh, 
use cases of data sharing. The other is when we try to optimize our monitoring and evaluation. Uh, different development organizations are working in different geographies. They have enough evidence on impact of different interventions on smallholder farmers. Uh, there have been cases where such data has been aggregated and uh, you have better insights on what works in different contexts because of data sharing. Uh, like Carl Rowe's uh, effort on data sharing in Kenya, uh, one cross-cutting theme that comes to my mind is the Indian government. They are working on something called the AgriStack. So the AgriStack is basically going to have three registries. One is farmer data and farmer land ownership data in one registry. The other is a, a registry of service providers for smallholder farmers. These service providers will be able to access data from the farmer registry based on APIs, and thirdly, they have a crop registry which will give a good indication of which farmers are growing what crops for demand-driven uh, planning. So through this interface, we believe that data flows between different value chain actors will be seamless and it will lead to optimization of agricultural value chains in India. We also had a presentation on the FarmFit Insights Hub in uh, today's morning session, and I think that's one of the initiatives where data is being collected and there are plans or at least a willingness to share and anonymize data for further analysis. Now scaling data sharing and uh, just a few key points that I wanted to cover. Uh, when we studied these use cases of data sharing, we understood that there are essentially five building blocks of data sharing. And many of these have been covered in the previous uh, conversations, but I'll try to name these five blocks. One is around data standards. Uh, that is, everyone is following standards which uh, improves interoperability of data. The second building block for us is data collection, because if you don't optimize data collection, you'll not optimize data sharing. And the last presentation was a lot about that. Uh, data security is another building block. Data governance is key to, uh, key to having good data sharing because finally we have to ensure that the benefits of data sharing are actually shared with smallholder farmers and there's a body of work now which is promoting farmer-centric data governance. And finally the last building block is what is the technology that you use to share data amongst different stakeholders. So if you have to promote data sharing, uh, we believe that you have to work on all five blocks, standardization, collection, data security, governance, and data transfer technologies. At the same time, there are some cross-cutting challenges which we think are necessary to be addressed. The first is, while we talk about data sharing, there's limited evidence or numbers on the business case of data sharing. Uh, everyone talks about how it's increased our outreach to farmers, but we don't actually have numbers which justify or which uh, uh, which actually say that data sharing has led to benefits to the private sector and it has also benefited smallholder farmers. Uh, there's been a lot of question, a uh, lot of comments around having 10,000 AI experts. Similarly, we have very few data experts who understand uh, how data sharing could work and what are some of the uh, modalities of sharing data amongst different stakeholders. Thirdly, legal risks. I think there's been also a lot of conversation around data security in this session. There are also social risks of data sharing. For example, if an enterprise A is sharing data with enterprise B, and this re results in a reduction in their cost, there is no mechanism to ensure that the reduction in cost will, not be, will be transferred to smallholder farmers. It's very difficult to monitor that, and it could lead to more exploitative behavior in terms of A and B and forming of oligopolies. So social risks are also a key challenge to uh, data sharing, and Finally, uh, pricing data as a commodity is, is still uh, difficult. Uh, I think it's, it's one of the topics which requires a lot of discussion that if you are sharing data, how do you price it? Now these challenges need to be addressed together to uh, solve data sharing and on a way forward, uh, as IDH and our partners that I mentioned and uh, Rabo Foundation specifically also interested in this case, we are trying to understand what is the business and impact case of data sharing. That's point number one that we want to understand. The second thing is we also want to understand what are the approaches for optimizing data sharing. So if we talk about the five building blocks, how can we optimize these five building blocks? The third thing that we want to focus on is what are the external accelerators of, of data sharing? Like can a digital public infrastructure actually accelerate data sharing between different stakeholders? At the end of the year and probably in 18 months when we have a more refined version, we want to have a toolkit on how the private sector can engage in data sharing. 
The second is uh, we also realized through these use cases that when it comes to servicing smallholder farmers, some of the core data fields which were common were close to 12 to 15 data fields. And that allowed uh, service providers to serve farmers and provide at least four to five different services to farmers. So we'll see if we can standardize or provide recommendations on how these 12 to 15 data fields can be collected. And finally, I think there's also a lot of value in creating a data visibility platform, which basically means that voluntarily stakeholders mention what data they have. They don't have to share the data, they just mention what data they have. And then if someone else is interested in that data, they'd get into direct communication with that stakeholder, uh, discuss with them and uh, ensure or use data uh, rather than not knowing that someone else might have the same data. Finally, a call to action. So because we'll be working on these things over the next few months um, and actually a year, uh, what uh, for SMEs and agribusinesses, we would want to know or we would want to learn from your learnings on how you have optimized your data journey in agriculture. So for example, if you have learned something about first mile data collection and you think that you have a very efficient way of collecting smallholder farmer data, we'll be happy to get in a conversation, learn from you and document it in the case. Secondly, uh, if you have innovative pilots around data sharing in your mind and you are looking for technical guidance or even resources to look at such pilots, uh, you can reach out to us and we'll be able to at least walk together and think together on how we can get these pilots executed on the ground and we would want to learn from these pilots. Uh, for development funders, I think there is a lot of talk about data. So if you want, I would really request that we pool resources to understand how uh, data sharing can be uh, maximized or optimized for smallholder farming. It cannot be done individually and this is one of the ways we can collaborate. And once we have these standards in place, when you're making new grants, maybe you could have simple uh, guidelines on following these standards uh, and any agritech that is getting money for you or any agricultural service provider actually follows these standards. So it'll lead to optimized or interoperable data at least amongst your grantees and other organizations that we partner with. I have my email address here for uh, any correspondence and, uh, ha and collaborating on this, but I think this is too small and you'll be able to find me here today through the evening. I'll be happy to discuss this in much more detail. Uh, thank you, everyone, and if there are any questions, and Emmanuel, if we have time for questions, we can take. Maybe one. 